Welcome to the Curie collection of web protocols. Um, I'm from Hamburg, uh, thus I'm German, and I like to start on time. I miss that, and thus I feel deeply sorry about it. My name is Ole Michaelis. I work for a company called The Simple. We'll talk about this later as well very shortly. I don't want to give this intro to the Courier collection alone, but I have a... What's the laws? Is this video free spirit? All right, that's Jeff, so I, I will not give this presentation alone, but I have Jeff with me. Um, but before we start, like a good pilot, let's do a little pre-flight check. Um, that's I want to talk about what is a protocol. So when I talk about a protocol, I basically talk about a thing that is defined by three main points. First point, it's a defined way to do a thing, right? So a protocol always is about a topic. In this case, how to do a thing is the topic, right? And as we're talking about web protocols, and we're somewhat, in a way, in a system, in a world where we talk about distributed systems, it's usually a description of how A talks to B. So we name this peers or um, sender and receiver, or maybe, in, especially in the web world, it's a server client pattern. Mostly, they are specified in ITF RFCs. That's a lot of abbreviations there. The IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force that's like roughly describe the organization that defines the web how it is and works. And they publish these RFCs. An RFC is a request for comments. Um, these are iterative protocol design specs um, that they publish on a regular basis, which each, of each RFC defines its, its protocol. Before we start, let's play a game. All right, let's play a game. You missed an awesome animation, I'm sorry. Um, so let's play protocol or not. Okay. Um, I'm totally sorry that you can't see what I'm seeing. So we play protocol not, um, and we play it without slides. Then, uh, luckily, we have sound, so um, we can play with sound. So the first protocol is HTTP. So raise your hands if you think HTTP is a protocol. Awesome! All hands up. <laughs> Obviously, right? HTTP is a protocol. Um, so you will have the nice uh, visuals like for the for the last ones. So we save this for the last ones. What about JSON? Raise your hand if you think JSON is a protocol. That's no hands. Mm. That's right. JSON is not a protocol. JSON is a data format. Well, that was the easy ones. So now let's talk about the more tricky ones. What about BitTorrent? Raise your hand if you think BitTorrent is a protocol. One hand, two hands, three, yeah, six, ten. Yeah, it is a protocol. Um, and it's funny because it's, it's a protocol, and in the same way, there's an application that is, th this name is BitTorrent, right? And imagine your browser would be named HTTP. That's kind of weird. But this is how things started and evolved in a, in, a, in a bigger way, and this is why it happened. OK, next up, that's WebRTC. So uh, before we do WebRTC, let's debug um, whatever is going on with the slides. Want to cheer for them, maybe? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Thank you. So now we give like extra credit beforehand, so there's a little bit of pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, that's basically uh, what you get when you do the first talk, right? Um, I don't know. I can I can share you one story, uh, one one tech issue story while we are fixing this. Um, I was on a pretty big conference in in Barcelona, and it was really well organized. It was in a big cinema um, or theater. They had a stage. There was a backstage. They had a moderator. So basically, every like they took care of everything. Um, so they moderated um, that I could come on stage. I joined them on stage, and then the projector went out black and the mic went out black, and. <laughs> It was really like a, it was a huge audience, like a thousand people, and 
I was really sw starting sweating. It's like, oh my God, what is going on? <laughs> and I saw you know, the tech people running really hectically in the background. And I know that they uh, were taken care of. And then, and that was a really relief moment. The organizers joined me on stage. So you get it? Awesome. Cheers. Thanks a bunch. Round of applause. Thanks. <laughs> cool. So now we can play this thing uh, with, with pictures. And now we were at protocol or not. So WebRTC. Who thinks WebRTC is a protocol? Raise your hands if you think WebRTC is a protocol. That's like five hands. <coughs> it's not. WebRTC is a collection of protocols. WebRTC itself is not a protocol, but it, it contains protocols like SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, and SCTP, that's the Stream con Control Transmission Protocol. And then there's Quote, that's the last one here. So who thinks Quote is a protocol? No hands? All right. Quote is a protocol. Um, and actually, quote is the quote of the day protocol. And it's specified in RFC 865. And as this is the first RFC we're talking about, I thought it's a cool RFC to just like show you. So I brought the whole RFC. That's, that's it. Right? So that's the whole how you deal with the quote of the day protocol. And I thought it might be a fun exercise to implement the protocol. So let's just skip the rest of the talk and implement it. OK, you should see what I see. That's a terminal. So now let me know if that's big enough. Is that big enough? OK, I got a few thumbs. So when we want to implement the quote of the day protocol, first thing we need is a, is a quote, right? So there's this, this thing called Fortune that gives me quotes. So that's the first piece we need. And then the protocol says it is, it is exposed, exposed on a network port, right? So we need to expose it on a network port, and we use NC. That's netcat, and netcat basically is a Swiss army knife for everything you want to do with a network. And the protocol specifies that it should be exposed on port 17. So we do this. And obviously, 17 is a privileged port, so we need pseudo writes, and now it's working. Right? So we have this thing running, and now we can ignore the errors. OK. Is that big enough as well? Great. And now we, what we need to do is we need to query it, right? So we again use netcat. We call to localhost on port 17. And we mistype localhost. And we get the quote back. And because of how netcat works, the server terminates. So with that, we implemented, like we fully implemented the, the, the spec on the quote of the day protocol. I think that's pretty impressive. But that's not it, because I want to make it really fancy. So let's, let's say we pipe it through pony say. And even that, we get back uh, our pony say quote, which is really huge. <laughs> OK, so that, that's it for implementing quote. Let's get back to this here. Cool. Awesome. So this was, to be honest, not the complete protocol, uh, because the protocol, funny enough, also specifies how you can do with UDP. So the protocol itself is not ridiculous enough, um, so you have to implement it on UDP and TCP. OK, we'll do some more, more coding and more netcat later in this talk. Now, let's talk about the protocol basics. Right? So before we dive into what, what makes the protocol. So what are the basically the requirements you have to a protocol? <laughs> this Jeff again. So first of all, a protocol defines data formats, right? Or it should. Not all of them do. But if they don't, they specify ASCII, and then you're going to go on ASCII, whatever you want to do, like JSON, XML, or whatever. Then they define the direction of flow. Think of HTTP, where it goes back and forth, or other protocols where it's more uh, center only. It has flow control, sequence control, error handling. And also, it specifies how to deal with a loss of information, right? Depending on what layer the protocol is, the loss of information is be dealt differently. Talking about layering, layering is really what makes protocol great. Not again, it makes protocols great. Um, and you probably are aware of this. That's the um, OC layering model. And what's pretty cool, and it, it, like when, when I had this in university or during my, my traineeship, I was totally not getting the point of this. But it's so cool when you, when you think about you're implementing a protocol on the upper layers. You don't have to care on what's going on down here. So imagine 
if you would not have this, your HTTP protocol has to care if it's be transmitted via electrical light, uh, electric, electricity or light on the, on the wire. Right? And lucky enough, we don't have to do with that. So this is what Layer gives us. So once you decide on what layer you're operating on, you don't care what's below that. So, right, you, so imagine we are implementing like in this area here, which is basically HTTP. You have to know about this, which is TCP, and you don't care about what's going on below that. And that's, that's the great part we get of the layering. This is a more simplified model, and it's basically the same information you see in there. But I like uh, how this is visualized um, with the off-branching. So the first protocol we want to take a look at is TCP. That's the Transmission Control Protocol. It's from the very early 80s, and it's basically the basic infrastructure of the what, what you know call web. That's basically uh, TCP is a big part of that. It's, spe it's specified in uh, quite a bunch of RFC. That's the most recently ones. Also, a fairly recent um, re republish of this is um, in the 6000s. So how does it work? How, how is TCP operating? Basically, think of you have a sender and you have a receiver. And whatever the sender is sending, the receiver has to acknowledge it, right? No matter how confusing it is, and <laughs> no matter how much bullshit it is, <laughs> the receiver has to acknowledge, right? And if you do this too often in TCP, the receiver might drop out. Um, what happens then? Well, this is what you know is UDP. That's a different protocol. And with UDP, you can basically just fire and forget and don't care if someone receives it and acknowledges it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's basically the difference between TCP and UDP. Now, TCP works with data frames because it's, it's running on the wire and it's a, yeah, it's an ASCII based protocol. And when I, talk, uh, when I think about the data frame, I would probably think of a model like this. Maybe it's even easier. Maybe you just have a destination port and a data, right? So I just want to send data to this port. And with the source port, you can actually do mapping. Uh, that's a pretty neat feature. But this is the real one, right? And when you compare this, this difference on, on what you might think it looked like and what it really looked like, there's a huge, huge difference, a huge discrepancy in there, and that makes clear that TCP has a lot of complexity in there, right? So we have the source support mapping, then we have the sequence number because TCP guarantees ordering, we have the acknowledgement number, we have a window, we have different flags, we still have some space reserved for more upcoming flags. I think that's pretty cool. Um, then we have the off offset, padding, and data. Now, there's the last actor in our presentation here, and that's Netcat. So let's meet Netcat. You, you met Netcat really, really recently. Um, let's take a look. There you go. So the first thing we can do with Netcat is what you just saw. We can do everything network. And you can you not do just text-based stuff. You can basically pipe anything through this. So let's say I have a, back a backup here. And I want to transfer my, back my backup through the web on a random, random port. So I can cat the backup and pipe it through Netcat and then open up another terminal. Make it bigger. And then connect to this again on the given port. And then pipe this back into, let's say, my backup because I'm in the same folder now and it would be really weird if I just do it in the same file. And this backup here is, to be honest, a Ubuntu image I downloaded yesterday. Uh, it's one gigabyte back. And it takes some time because it is, again, going through the whole network stack, right? In my case, I'm copying this from my, my one terminal window to the other, all local. This doesn't make any sense. But that's pretty cool if you think about this, that you can use like, the network stack with just the one command on the shell. And there you see, it's, it's done already. So that's TCP. Now, <laughs> it's takeaway time. When, when I talk about all the different protocols, um, there's a lot of stuff you, can, you, you could take out of this, right? If you implement an application, what can you learn from TCP? What can you learn from the given protocol? Well, for TCP, you really see that it gives you a lot of strong guarantees, right? It guarantees that all packets you send like, come, back, come back in in, a give, in, the, in the order you sent them. This is not, this is not given like, per se on, on the internet or on networks 
themselves, right? So due to how packets are routed, it can happen that the first package is the last one you receive. And this has to be handled, and TCP does that. It also hides a lot of complexity. I think this is really a takeaway we can have for our day-to-day -day applications, is that hiding complexity is really a good thing, right? Why would you expose all of that if you can live and can handle it with a very little bit of, of um, input and then do the complex operations in the background? And also, and this should be pretty clear, it's a really good foundation, right? And this also is true for all of all our, our everyday software life, if we have a good foundation, we are able to deliver fast and deliver fast and good results, right, in, this, in a fast manner. Imagine um, HTTP would be implemented in UDP, and when we ignore whatever Google is doing at the moment with a quick protocol, um, it would be really weird if there's a package just dropping out, right? Imagine your website would randomly load without the CSS. That's really weird. So talking about HTTP. And that's the next protocol I want to take a really quick look on. I think it should be fairly obvious what it does. HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. It's from the mid-90s, so it's over 20 years old already. Um, it's basically what we also call the internet, right? That's HTTP protocol. And I want to really briefly show how it looks like on the wire. So we use a utility like curl. And when we talk about HTTP 1, it's a text-based protocol. Like All the stuff I'm telling you here and showing you now for HTTP is only true for one. It's a complete different show for HTTP2. It's really interesting. I gave a talk on this uh, the last year I was here. Um, and if you want to know more about this, just come to me afterwards. But you can fill up an entire talk. So this is why we skip it here. And as you can see here, it's a text-based protocol. It follows a request-response sequence. So you send a request to, to the server, then the server replies back. And here, we are following a redirect, so we do this over again. Let's see one, how we can do this with Netcat, right? Can we implement it? Like on the on the CLI, all on, all on our own. So this example is done, and my notes are in the wrong order here. Okay. So what what we want to do is we want to send a request, and we need to type echo correctly. So we want to send a get. Then we have the path, and then we need to specify the protocol. Then we have a new line, and then the protocol requires us to send a host. So let's talk to Google.com, and then we have two new lines again. And again, we pipe this to Netcat, call whatever IP is behind google.com on port 80. And you see, with just, just that command, we are able to do a, a full HTTP request. Right? And I think that's what also is pretty awesome about the protocol, that it's really good and spectable. OK, let's go back to the presentation here. Now. Takeaway time. What can we learn from HTTP? I mean, it's a protocol I bet all of us are dealing with every day. And probably even in this presentation, you had your phone out and called any website or API with your apps. That's probably HTTP. It's everywhere, literally. So HTTP is stateless, right? You know this. It follows a request response pattern. Everything you need to, you need to have to process a request must be part of the request. And then you can send a response. One is really easy to inspect and it has a wide adoption. And now let's think about TCP and HTTP in this, in this connection. So TCP gives you the strong guarantees. And building up on this, we have the scalability of HTTP, right, because of its statelessness. And this is why the adoption is so high. So we have strong guarantees in a scalable manner. And this is really what was the groundbreaking news when HTTP was released and the idea of REST. And this is why probably most of the time we build stuff on top of that. Now let's come to the first protocol that goes into the curio part of this talk. So let's talk about who is. Um, I'm not going to ask you what, but do you know what it is? I, I, I don't want to double check with you. OK, so we have a few hands here. Basically, who is is the yellow pages of the internet. That's the idea when it was released. So imagine I could query any server in the web and asking for your address. That'd be really weird. right? But this is how they imagined the internet could function when, when they started right in the, in the mid-90s. Nowadays, it's mostly used for DNS and uh, how TLD lookups work. Um, the full name is Rafael, who is. And I want to read the, proto the protocol specification to you so you can grasp what it really is and means. So a who is server listens on TCP port 43 for requests from who is clients. The who is client makes a text request to the who is server, then the who is server replies with the text content. 
All requests are terminated with ASCII carriage return and then ASCII line feed. The response may contain more than one line of text, so the presence of an ASCII carriage return or ASCII line feed characters do not indicate the end of their response. The WHOIS server closes its connection as soon as the output is finished. The closed TCP connection is the indication to the client that the response has been received. So what really stood out when I was reading this is that the server can indicate whatever the client received. I think that's super weird, and in, mo in, in, in modern protocols, this would never happen, right? So the server can indicate that someone received something. That's totally not true. Well, they can't say that they received it, but they can't guarantee that it was processed and like, that it was in a state that it was like, good to consume. So again, let's do a little Natcat example here. <laughs> so um, let's not use Natcat because um, Netcat basically needs uh, the input up front. And with Telnet, which is pretty much similar, we can um, do similar things, but type um, along the way. That's just random stuff. I'll talk about this in a second. And we can connect to this host. And then we can give the host a query string. And then the host comes back, and I'll zoom out a bit with the basically the yellow pages entry, right? So we get everything we want to know. We get the, the registrar, which is mark monitor, and then we get the name servers for this, and we can basically get everything that's needed here. So you can also use the Mac utility who is for that, but it's, as you will see in a second, basically doing a similar thing, right? So let's get back to the presentation. So you might wonder about the address I was like typing or copying here from my, from my notes. And this is really the only magic bit in here. And for this, you need to know about IANA. IANA is an organization, um, and the abbreviation stands for Internet Assigned Numbers and Authority. So basically, all port numbers, all addresses, all root servers, and everything that cannot be received in a dynamic manner in the Internet is given away by IANA. And everyone agrees that they are the ones who can do that. Um, and they also say, for the .com registry, you need to talk, for who is services, you need to talk to this domain. It was just entering there. And this is a quote also from the who is RFC, and I also want to go over this with you really quickly because I think that's interesting. It reads, for historic reasons, who is lacks many of the protocol design attributes, for example, internationalization and strong security, that would be expected from any recently designed IETF protocol. And this is in a fairly new RFC. So they, over, they, they redid the US RFC to make stuff more clear, more concise, but they didn't change the implementation. And they also added this paragraph. And I think this is another takeaway for, for, for the next slide that we can have now, that they rather acknowledge the fact that it's missing over re-implementing it, right? Because re-implementing would mean every client that is using who is, and nowadays in the internet, there's a lot of clients doing it, would need to re-implement the features as well. So they rather acknowledge it. So now, you know that sound. Take away time again. What can we learn from who is? Well, first of all, it also follows a request response pattern. It looks a bit different than HTTP, but it's you send a query, you get an answer back. Right? It is super, super simple. It's basically you send a like an input string, it's just one line, so you can't do anything with lines there because the first line feed is the end of the input. It's not the end of the output, but the end of the input. And also, and this is what I just said, it's addressing the shortcomings, right? It, hasn't, it does not have any internationalization or security con concerns addressed in there. But rather than implementing it, it acknowledges it. And this is, again, something that we can address in our day-to-day -day application life that maybe something, especially when we have a lot of third parties consuming our stuff, um, that we rather address shortcomings and offer ways, ways to work around it than addressing it and force everyone to re-implement it. So another protocol you probably all use, and I'm pretty sure most of you have used today, is SMTP. SMTP is the simple mail transfer protocol. It's also from the early 80s, and it's basically the protocol to send out emails. And I also want to walk, um, walk through this with you, together with you, here really quickly on the terminal. I just need to copy this over. Okay. 
So first thing we do, we use Telnet again. We connect to Melgun um, because Melgun is a service I use for one of my side projects, and they offer an SMTP server, so I don't want to start an SMTP server my own now. So we connect to them, and we get the first status code back. And the first thing we have to do, we have to greet. So we say, hello. And no, that's not a typo. That's how the protocol does it. And we get a response code back, so it looks good. So we say, it's a, it's a mail from. It's a mail from. And it's from my per private email address. So if you want to send me lovely letters, copy that. And the recipient is info at slatter.io. And then that's accepted. That's good. Because if, if I would flip it, and that's the way how Megan works, we would get rejected at this point already. And now we can send data. So the server replies, OK, got it, continue. So again, we have the from. And that's now it's a header. It's not part of the protocol. It's part of the um, mail headers. So it's, again, to, just to be consistent, from. And then it's to. It's info at slatter.io. And then we have a subject, and that's hello from Cotalks. And then we have a body, so that's, hey, body. Hey, buddy. Um, so well, how, how would you end this, right? I mean, can you go enter, enter? And that's, that, that's really the most funny part about the protocol. You just do dot, <laughs> and it's great success. <laughs> I, like, I honestly wonder how they, how they like, do it on the protocol if you end your email with a dot. Um, I haven't inspected it. I think that's really funny. Um, now it's the, the task to get out of, of Telnet. Okay, so we just sent an email, and I'm not kidding you, um, I got it on my phone. So there's an, there's an email. But it's in the spam folder, and we'll talk about this in a second. Also, you might wonder while, um, why, why was he even able to type all of this? Shouldn't the server just get a timeout? Well, the timeouts are specified in the RFC. And this, this RFC comes from a time where sending single characters over the wire took at least seconds, right? So sending multiple characters and maybe even a whole email body was really a thing. It took long, right? A, a friend that I just was demoing this presentation to said, well, you know, think about um, that you had a post out box and you would write your emails offline and then dial into your modem and then do the sending process, right? It was, real, it was a thing. Not like today you would just go send and whatever. So hey Jeff, it's takeaway time again. Let's see what we can take away from SMTP. First of all, simple is not easy, right? It is a really simple task to send an email, as you just saw. But to make the email go to the actual inbox and not to spam is really where this stuff gets complicated. Then think about, um, multi-content emails, so where you have a plain text and an HTML version. That's complex. If you have attachments, if you have attachments in your email that should not be displayed as attachments, like images, but rather be displayed inline your HTML email. This is where stuff gets really complex. Also, it's stateful. Um, so you saw I was typing a command, and then I was building up the state on the, on the wire on the, in the process of sending that email. And also, and this is something I really like about the protocol, it does this responsibility handover. So I type hello, and the server acknowledges that it received it and that I can continue, right? I said mail from, I sent recipient um, to, and all of this works right out of the hand. Another protocol I want to talk about is DNS. And when I, when I talk about DNS, the first thing that comes to my mind, because I'm working in a company that deals with DNS, is that we are talking here about the two hard things in computer science, right? So it's about naming and caching. Um, so DNS is really an interesting problem to deal with. It's a domain name services. It's from the late 80s. And this is how it works. You have a, you have a, um, a client that basically wants to know an address, right? Because the internet works with IP addresses and not with domains. So the question we have is, where is foo.com? And then we have a server. The server replies that foo.com is at this IP. So now let's take a look at Netcat again. Just need to update my notes. OK, so we want to do DNS. And DNS is a binary protocol, so we don't do any Netcat. All right, I missed a thing. And just for you, I want to go back. I could have left it. Oh my god, I could have left it. So because it's not Netcat, 
because it's a binary protocol, but rather terminal cat. Okay, I missed the joke, I'm sorry, but you still get terminal cat. I think that's fair. Um, okay, so we want to do a, a, a query. And the first query we might have is, well, give me, give me an IP for this host, right? And there's also the short flag, so you can use it in uh, Bash script, for example. You can also query, you can query for different record types, like a TXT record. In this case, it's an SPF record. Oh, and this is what I think is also pretty interesting. You can trace requests, and it would go down the whole resolving chain. So here, the, the different root servers, the root servers are defined by Ayana again. So they tell me, so I know where to start my lookup, right? So I start at com, then I look for uh, in.com for where is google.com. Then they tell me I can look up google.com over here. So I talk to this server, and they give me back this. So there I can resolve it, right? Again, DNS is a fairly complex matter, and I could fill a whole talk with that. If you want to know more on how DNS works, we have a eight series webcomic um, on how DNS works, and it's pretty neat. It goes into all the, the nitty gritty details of glue records, authoritative DNS servers, resolvers, um, root servers, and all of this is in there. So you can find it at howdns.works. Again, Jeff's back, takeaway time. What can we learn from a protocol like DNS? Well, first of all, it's an early binary protocol, and it's designed for performance. And it's, it's like these two points, they relate to each other a lot, right? It's a binary protocol because it's really performant, or it must be really performant, because they knew when they designed it that it's basically in the way of every request you're making, right? Every request you're making, you're making it to a host name. But this is not how the network stack works. The network stack needs to have an IP to make the actual request. So DNS is basically in every request you're making. It's part of it. And this is why caching is such a big topic. And whenever you dealt with it and created a new record or even updated a record, you probably were angering that your site is down um, because you like, approach it the wrong way, to be honest, and uh, you're waiting for the TTL to expire. And then what makes this matter even worse is that there are a lot of servers, and especially resolvers, that ignore the TTL. And it's also more or less extensible, um, but as you can see by all the like, different RFCs it's defined in, because DNS is defined in over 50 different RFCs, um, you can tell that it's at least somewhat extensible. The next protocol is uh, XML. Wait, no, let's totally not talk about this. Um, first of all, uh, there are better standards by now, and it's not even RFC. I would even not call this standard, because no one ever published something that would define it as a thing. Right? There are frameworks, early frameworks. There's one website that looks like it's from the early 90s as well that like, defines a way how they did this thing, and this is what you find when you search for a standard. But yeah, it's not an RFC, so I basically want to skip it for this talk. So let's talk about FTP. FTP is really interesting. FTP is the file transfer protocol. It's also from the early 80s, and it works on top of TCP. It is also specified in a lot of different RFCs, right? It's in, in almost 15 different RFCs. And if you're like me around your 80s, you're probably uh, 80s, <laughs> around your 30s, born in the 80s, um, you probably have seen this, right? FileZilla, been a huge, huge part of my teenage, teenage age. I used a lot to download things. Um, <laughs> legal things. Um, so let, let's do Netcat here. And this is really, that's a longer demo. Um, but I also think it's a really fun demo because FTP is a pretty, pretty interesting protocol. So um, there's, a, there's an FTP server. It's Node FTP, so yeah, it's Node. Don't hate me for that. And I want to start the server. So we have the server up here running. It's on port 7002. And this already got this thing running. So we make it a bit. So we zoom in. All right. So first thing we need to do is we want to telnet to this. Whoopsie. To localhost on this port. So as you can see, we are connected. First thing we want to do is we want to authenticate. In this example, like as the server is like written by myself, or at least implementation, um, or the wrapping around the library or whatever. Um, there is no real password, so I can just do pass and user like something whatsoever. It would it would allow me access any anyway. Um, and this was the boring part to be honest. And now let's take a look at the the interesting part because FTP works in a way that the data transport is decoupled from the controlling uh, from the controlling part. 
So let's open this up here. And then let's specify that we tell the server to connect to this thing here with this weirdo. We talk about this in a second. Um, we need netcat listening over here on this port. And now this was OK. And I can tell the FTP server now to give me directory listing. And the directory listing would show up on the other TCP connection. That is pretty, I think that's pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. And that's pretty, that's also pretty unique for, for a protocol. So you, you have seen this and you might wonder like, what, wait, what is that about? Um, <laughs> so in the protocol they say it's H1, H2, H3, H4. Well, the first H's are the host, the host IP. Um, I, <laughs> you can guess like how, how complicated it would be to do FTP with the syntax over IPv6. Um, but well, that's that problem, I don't know. Uh, and then let's take a look at P1, P2, because that was really weird, right? So the 16 somehow translate to 4,000 something. You might guess already, right? So the port is defined by P1 times 256 plus P2. For whatever reason, they decided that's the best way to put the protocol, uh, the, the port format. I don't know, it was really confusing for me in the first place, but uh, OK. Let's talk about some RFC highlights. So especially in FTP, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And I promised you a curio collection. So this is really the curio part. Interesting in here, and they call this a simple model. Oh, no, we call it a simple model in a second. So wh what's interesting over here is that they specify the user interface in here. In modern protocols, you would never see this. The user interface is always left over to the implementer, and they don't care. They always talk about network. And this is a simple model. They say simple model. And it's um, how you do a reset. Right? So this is really, I just copied this from the RFC. It's really in there. And you might wonder why this is a simple model. Well, this is a not so simple model, because that's a model of how a f login flow works. And now imagine you have to implement this and just staring at this weird thing. And then you have the map. So you have a mapping of the numbers like below this. But I wonder if this really helps. So that's a login sequence. Now, for the second last time, takeaway time. What can you learn? What can you learn from FTP? So first of all, and that's what I already mentioned, is that the connection management is done by the user, right? So we have passive versus active mode. This is basically when NATing was around and servers, and not every device had their own IP address anymore. Uh, you could also have a mode where the client, the data client, connect to the server. And also, and this relinks back to like my title with FTP, um, they had a lot of security issues in the RFC. Um, it was really hard like, to have an, an up-to-state up implementation and having it secure. There was a lot of security leaks. And this is also a thing we can take away for our day-to-day -day application is because most of us, myself very much included, don't care enough about security, right? So last protocol, and that's also pretty interesting, and it's really, and I saved this for the last part for our Curio collection, and you might wonder why, and you will see in a minute. So NTP is the network time protocol. It's also from the mid-80s, and it's basically, its job is to transport time on the network, right? So I can ask the server what time is it and get a reply. Let's, let's take a last look to NetCat. So... Let's close all of this. And I remember that was really hard to make this all go on. OK, cool. So let's, let's implement our own server again, right? So first of all, we need a date. So we can date the gate and just paste it um, and expose it on port. So I open up, whoopsie, where are you, boy? Um, OK, what we have here, um, we know how to collect, connect to localhost on this given port not this given port, and we get the date back, right? This is how it works. But now, this is obviously not how it works, and I saved one for, for you now. Um, what about if there is network delay? So this is my version of network delay. It's pretty accurate. Ask your operators. That's really how it works. And then we again do this thing, and we listen on this port. So now, the time I get back is 10 seconds old, right? So in the naive implementation we did, we completely ignored the fact that we are on a network, and that network means physics. Physics is limited, at least in how we do it now, by the speed of light. And this will never get us the, like, the super exact time. So 
this NTP comes in here to help us. We can ask, let's say, Google Time Servers with the NTP, uh, NTP date, and I totally did not the right thing. Uh, so Q is for query, so it will not try to set the date. And it takes some time, and here you see what makes NTP work is basically you get an offset and a delay, and with these numbers you can calculate the actual time you want to set in your system. Okay. So again, there's one last game I prepared for you. Let's have one more. And you missed the last one, right? You missed the animation. I'm so sorry for that. So let's play how many RFC pages are in the NTP spec, right? So we're talking about NTP v4, the four versions around already. The last one was released like two years ago. I didn't want to hear numbers. How many US letter size, like regular font size pages I would need to print the complete RFC? Like give me some numbers. 20, more, more numbers. Nah, more. Nah, it's not 256, but that would, give, that would be a good number. So in order to specify NTP completely, it would take up to 104 pages. And you might wonder why, right? Like, what in hell? It's just give me the time on the network. It shouldn't be that hard. I mean, you can have quote of the day on a single page, so why would you need for just time so many pages? So that's one, one reason. Um, that's just one, one um, diagram I copied out of that. There are plenty of them. And now let's come to our last category, which is things you would not believe are part of NTP, right? That's really, it's super weird. <laughs> so first of all, it has handling. It has a specified handling of server clusters, right? So NTP includes a way of how a cluster of servers needs to communicate with each other and with a third-party NTP server to get them all on the same date. And if you think about this for a second, you may come to the point why, why this is necessary. Because when we are in a, we are in a world of distributed computing and all the computing you, needs, you need to do, you can probably cannot do it on a single host. And when you do computing in a network, you will deal with conflicts. At some point, with eventual consistency, you will deal with conflicts. And one fairly common strategy to deal with conflicts is just to apply the newest version. But how would you pick the newest version if the servers are not in the same time? Right? So this creates a huge conflict, and this is really what a lot of the pages of the 104 NTP pages are about, is basically getting a bunch of servers to the same time. Then also, it has strategies included for leap time or leap seconds, because how we deal, like the concept of time we're having and using is not scientific, 100% correct. So, so usually the days are a bit longer, um, it varies, and sometimes there's a leap second to not like, r let this drift off. And my favorite strategy is from Google Time Servers. So one strategy that they allow is to ignore it, but just ignoring it is obviously not enough because that way you would drift off. But what Google does, if you ask Google for the current time, the atomic time server will actually include and spread out the leap seconds over the entire time. So a second on the Google name servers is not the actual second. It's more, a bit more. Just a really tiny little bit, but it's more. Um, that's interesting. And also, and that's my absolute favorite, it contains reference code for orbital satellite base time. That's in the RFC. And this sounds really, like, really, really important, but when you think, think about what, if you think about what this means, is that it's basically getting time from GPS. And that's also part of NTP, because the whole RFCs and the whole internet stuff is not only for web, right? It's for everyone. So they have it in there as well. One last time. Let's have takeaway time. And let's see what we can learn from this. So first of all, it's a really simple task, right? Getting in time with a network shouldn't be, shouldn't be that hard. I told you why it is that hard, and also that is what I think is really interesting. It has a complex implementation, as you saw with all the cluster stuff, um, satellites, communications, and distributed systems, but it hides a lot of the complexity. And this is also what this is totally a takeaway for our day-to-day -day applications, is that we deal with complexity a lot, right? If there wouldn't be all of this complexity, we wouldn't have our jobs, right? Because this is basically what, what, what makes us important to handle complexity and also hide it, right? Handle complexity and hide it. And I think this is what we can learn a lot from all of these protocols. 
So that was the brief, the brief tour of the Curie collection of web protocols. My name is Ole Michaelis. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I just recently changed names. It's my first name plus the last name minus the vowels. So it's a really mathematic, correct uh, Twitter handle. And it's the same thing for, for the internet. So it's ole.michels.works. And no, it's not a Polish version. That's not true. <laughs> I work for a company called The Insimple. We do domain management automation. You can buy and manage your domain through us. We have a wonderful API. Uh, wonderful user interface. We have a Halloween special, so that's something I brought to you. Um, if you sign up with this link, you will not only get three months of free service, you will not only receive in your actual mailbox, like your postal mailbox, a uh, bunch of stickers, you'll also get a free.com domain. So we will give away 50.com domains for free for one year. And if you sign up through this link during the conference, so you have today and tomorrow using this link to sign up, we'll give you a free.com domain if you're into that. That is all I got. Thank you very much. Yeah, so with all the technical difficulties we had, um, I think we don't have time for questions. Just come up, approach me over here. I brought a lot of the stickers, so if you're interested in stickers, the simple stickers, I have all of them here. If you have questions, if you want to talk about anything, approach me on Twitter, come over here. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>